Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Engaging the Phenomenon. And today, uh, we are honored to have on our guest, Terry Lovelace, who is the author of Incident at Devil's Den. So welcome, Terry. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, and I, I think um, some people here might be familiar with your case. If they're not, they're going to become familiar uh, at this point. Uh, but I, I think, um, you know, something that was very interesting about your case to, to start off with is that you were you were actually in the Air Force when it occurred, right? I, I was, but, you know, by way of a brief bio, I might just say, you know, I graduated from high school in 73, went into the uh, Air Force uh, and stayed as an enlisted guy for six years, got out in 79, finished my undergrad, uh, went to law school, uh, and then I made my living in the law uh, until I retired in 2012, which was a lot of the reason I didn't feel like coming forward with this story because it would have been career suicide. Um, yeah. So it's my pleasure to talk about it now. Yeah. And that's, that's a very long time to have to, 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 to keep that in. Um, so that's, I mean, you know, I, I'm, you know, kudos to you, you know, for having the bravery to come out after all that time and, and share your experience. Cause it is important that people know about these kind of things that occur uh, cause they do occur to a number of people. And so let's, let's, I want to go back to the, the, the incident at devil's den. So, you know, again, people there, there's a book incident at devil's den. There's going to be a link in the description to the book. So, you know, if you want to get the book, you can, um, but I do want to start there because that's where I started when I came across your uh, your experience. So yeah, can you that's... tell us how that came about? How did you how did you come about to to going to this area named Devil's Den? And what happened? Sure. Um, while I was on active duty, I was a, a medic and an EMT, and I worked in an emergency room for, at Whiteman Air Force Base. And Whiteman's still around. It's on the western side of the state of Missouri, about an hour and a half from Kansas City. And it's, uh, it's where they house B-2 bombers today. Uh, there was a nuclear base when I was there, and they had Minutemen 2 ICBMs scattered all over the countryside. And um, my friend Toby walked up to me in the middle of the night. We were playing cards and said, hey, man, I got an idea. Let's go camping. And I'm like, what? Because I, you know, I had never been camping in my life. I knew he grew up in Flint, Michigan. I suspected he had never been camping in his life, and that was true. Um, but he was really big on this idea of taking a camping trip. And we had to go to Devil's Den. He uh, he claimed that he talked to some guy that uh, went down there and, and talked about this plateau um, that I think I may have sent you a picture of from Google Earth. Um, there, there is a plateau there, and uh, we uh, took a long weekend, packed up the car, bought you know bought a ten dollar Kmart tent, and you know packed the cooler and some stuff, and uh, we drove down to Devil's Den, and it was about a, a little over a six hour drive, just on the other side of the Missouri border in Arkansas, in, in northwest Arkansas, and found found the park, uh, pulled in, and we were. I was all for staying in the campground. My friend, uh, not so much. He was like, you know, we're going to have people to the right of us, people to the left of us. You know, let's make this a real, uh, a real camping experience. You know, we'd be real outdoorsmen, right? Um, so we were going to go find our own, our own campground. And he was really big on trying to find this plateau, which uh, we did by accident. We. You know, we dodged the kiosk with the ranger, the ranger station where you get the camping permit. Took a road uh, back into the, to started driving around, took a road back in, traveling in kind of a northwesterly direction and uh, paved road turned to gravel, kind of turned to dirt. And then there was a chain sign across the road worded like, you know, no trespassing, keep out, no honey, no camping, no fishing, no nothing. Uh, I thought that it was kind of a nature preserve. I didn't, I didn't learn uh, until 2016 that where we spent the night on top of this plateau wasn't even in Devil's Den State Park. 
It's in, a, it's in a strip of land that's owned by the Bureau of Land Management. Um, and what's, what's crazy is uh, they mow the top of this plateau. I mean, it's flat as a pool table up there, but it's the height of the surrounding treetops. And unless you're right on it, you can't see it. So US government pays for a guy in a tractor with what's called a brush hog to go up there and clear cut that uh, several times a year. And because uh, I was shocked, I would have thought there'd been 40 year old mature trees up there by now, but there's not. So we, um, you can't see because it's level with the treetops, you really can't see in the summertime, at least that plateau. Uh, but we were fortunate enough to, we drove right to it. And there was a road that went straight up and we, uh, we went around the chain link fence, of course, and uh, we crested the top of this hill and it was just, it was just beautiful. It's a great looking place. It had, you know, maybe grass about six foot high, you know, wildflowers, and it was just pretty, just a nice place. The view was fantastic. And we set up our camp there. And we, uh, you know, we did all the stuff you do on a camping trip that's fun. I mean, it was all new stuff to us. You know, set up a tent, built a campfire, went for a hike. Um, and that night we were sitting around a campfire and they're about maybe six, eight feet between us with a campfire between us. And we're talking over the campfire and this sounds really cliche, I know, but this is true. And I've heard other people tell me the same thing. And that is that the sounds of the forest, like crickets, tree frogs, all that stuff that makes noise in the woods um, stopped and it went dead silent. And it kind of freaked me out or I found it unnerving. And I looked at my friend and I said, you know, is it awful quiet out here to you? Well, you know, it wasn't even, it wasn't just quiet. Uh, we had a nice breeze going on before, and the breeze had even stopped. So it was still, it's probably a better word. And my friend's kind of oblivious. He's like, yeah, don't worry about the bugs. They'll come back. Uh, no big deal. You know, and I, and I felt silly, but um, so we're talking, just kind of having a conversation. And uh, he turns his head to the west and says, hey, Terry, were those lights there before? And I'm like, what lights? I don't know what you're talking about. I, I couldn't see them because his torso was in the way, the way he, we were seated on air float, inflatable air mattresses and his torso was in the way. So I had to stand up and I looked over his head and sure enough, they're on the horizon, just above the horizon. Uh, there were three bright stars, uh, all the same, about the same luminosity, just above the horizon. Uh, I mean, too far above the horizon to have been lights from, you know, a parking lot or a train or something. And this was really a remote area at the time. I mean, it, it's still remote, but back in 1977, it was very remote. Um, and I said, no, I don't remember those. And we're kind of looking at them and um, they caught our attention. And while we're watching them, they moved. And the first thing they did was the three points of light rotated like they were on an axis and turned about 120 degrees. And when they did, the base of the triangle uh, was parallel with the horizon. And then it started to move up and it went straight up in the air, uh, heard no noise, never heard any noise. Um, and it reached and out to the, you know, what I call a ceiling. It, it reached the spot where it came to a halt. And then uh, it was in an orientation like this with the three stars. When it reached a spot where it stopped, it kind of turned like that. And what we saw was three tiny lights in a row because we were looking at the thing head on. Um, I have no idea what altitude it was at, but I mean, it was, pretty high up, it was, it was tough to see. And uh, we're debating what this is, but only briefly. And then it's, uh, 
you know, conversation is over. We just, we just watched. And uh, I never felt any fear. As a matter of fact, when the, about the time this thing started moving up into the air, I felt this experience of calm where I felt, you know, just a bit unnerved about the stillness, the silence. Um, I felt this kind of like a wave of uh, calm. And that washed over me a couple of times. And I had no anxiety, no fear. Um, matter of fact, I felt kind of um, detached, more like a, an observer than a participant in what was going on. I don't know how else to describe it. And while we watched, it started a, like a glide plane down in our direction. And we could see the three lights in a row. So we knew the thing was headed towards us. And um, it got bigger. The lights grew further apart. Again, still no sound. And we watched it come in and it illuminated. There were lights on the apex, on points of the triangle that were, was all illuminated. And as it, it got down probably about 5,000 feet over the forest and cast shadows because it was illuminating, lit up the treetops. Um, and it came to a halt um, about 3,000 feet over our heads and just stopped. And um, we weren't, fortunately, the, where we had camped, we weren't directly underneath the thing. We were kind of offset to the side, but that was actually kind of an advantage because then we could Later on, we could see the side of it and, and see the thing in better detail. And uh, that, that calm thing um, was interesting. It was, it was like our emotions were muted or it, it wasn't the proper reaction to what we were seeing. I mean, we should have been you know, freaked out. We should have been maybe anxious, um, but instead we were both just, um, there. And while we watched, um, a light came on from underneath this thing and about dead center. And uh, it was a white light um, about the diameter of a softball, at least on the ground it was. And it went straight up to the middle of this thing at about 3,000 feet. And it just popped on and hit our, hit our campfire and was on for maybe 60 seconds, probably less, and then just clicked off. And then in its stead, there came, um, lasers were kind of a new deal in 1977. I'd seen them on television, but I, I had, had never seen one, you know, in reality. And this laser light popped on and the beam, came from the same place, the center of the triangle. It was about the diameter of a, of a lead pencil. And it would land at a spot in the campsite for really a millisecond and then turn off and then a millisecond later, it would come back in another area of the campground. <laughs> so that it looked like it was dancing all over the place. Um, but it never, it never struck the ground. It struck me, it struck me at least three times. I know in the chest, I never felt anything. I know it struck my friend, it struck my car. It struck uh, Toby's backpack, um, his cooler. So it was like all the things that we brought with us. It, and I thought this thing's checking us out. I, that was my, was my thought. And that lasted a little longer than a minute. I, I, can't, I can't be for sure, but. Uh, and then that turned off. And then really what happened next was that feeling of calm that we had transitioned to sleepy. And there's a distinct difference between the two. Now, you know, we were young guys, we were in good shape. Uh, we were used to working a night shift. Uh, yeah, we were tired from a six and a half hour drive, but I, I didn't think we should have been sleepy looking back at it. That, didn't make sense. But all I wanted to do was go into the tent and go to sleep. And my friend said, 
And this was the first words he, he spoke since the thing got started. And he said, show's over. And he stood up and he grabbed his air mattress and he walked a few feet in back of us to the tent, threw his air mattress in and then just fell on top of it. And I did the same thing. Uh, I followed suit. We never said a word. Uh, I threw my air mattress in. I fell on top of it. I never bothered to take off my shirt, my combat boots, my you know blue jeans, anything. I just fell on top of the thing and I was out. Um, I mean, the last thought that I had, and I remember this clearly, was that uh, was that my friend was wrong because the the noises never did come back. It was still dead silent. I woke up. Um, I was able to figure out later it was near sunrise, uh, but it was still, it was pitch dark. And I, I saw these flashing lights and they were yellow and white and kind of an orangey. And uh, they were just flashing at odd intervals, but they were bright. And when they flashed, they would light up the inside of that tent because uh, otherwise it was pitch black. And I thought, you know, this is probably a ranger's truck, a park ranger there to kick us out, you know, with the overhead flashing lights they have. Um, and then I noticed that uh, my combat boots were unlaced and they were unlaced almost all the way down. And I knew that I didn't go to bed with them like that. I knew I wouldn't, I would, I would either take them off or I would have had them laced up, but I wouldn't have had them on my feet unlaced. I mean, it's a trip hazard. And, uh, you know, when you're in the military, they teach you how to take care of your feet. And uh, I just, that, that puzzled me. So I took my, my boots off and uh, noticed my socks were on sideways. Now that was really unusual because I knew I did not do that. I would not do that. To this day, I wouldn't do that. So I took everything off, more annoyed than anything, put it on properly, laced them up. And then I turned to my friend who's already on his knees and he's looking outside the tent. And Toby was uh, African-American and there was a, in the, when the light would flash through the canvas of the tent, it illuminated, there was a, um, a the track of a tear. Cause I guess, I guess the salt illuminated uh, in the flash of light. And I could see a, a white streak there. And that was my first uh, real fear. Uh, you know, I wasn't worried about park rangers throw, throwing us out. That wasn't a real concern. Um, but it was a concern when I saw my friend um, had been crying because I couldn't imagine what would make this guy cry. And I got to my knees and I'm like, what is it, man? Is it park rangers? What's out there? And he's like, shh, and trying to get me to be quiet and, uh, but not giving me a clear answer. And I look for myself out of the flap on the right side of the tent. And um, the thing that had been 3000 feet over our heads when we went to bed uh, had descended and it was now 30 feet over the floor of the meadow. So, and that's why these lights were so bright. And the light we were seeing was the flashing lights off the points of the triangle. It was, um, yeah, it, it, was, it was about 30 feet. And we, like I say, we weren't directly under it, we were offset. And um, the next, the second thing I noticed was in one of these flashes of light, I saw what I took to be, and I should, I should have counted them, 12, maybe 15 kids. I thought they were kids walking around. And I'm like, Toby, man, what the hell are these kids doing out here in the middle of the night, you know, in the middle of nowhere? And he's like, Terry, man, those ain't no little kids. Look at them. And um, that's when I saw that they, 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 they weren't human. They had the long spindly arms. I mean, they were classic little gray guys, um, three and a half feet tall, maybe three, three and a half feet tall. Uh, heads disproportionately large, spindly bodies, long limbs. Um, and they were busted up into groups of like twos and threes. 
and they were just kind of wandering around this meadow. I mean, like tourists or something. And they walked with a very distinctive gait. I don't know what the reason for that was, but they walked almost with a limp, like, they, like their feet were sore. Um, I don't know. Uh, so I am scared to death. Um, I'm afraid we're going to sneeze or cough or do something to draw their attention to us. Because, we, I mean, we really didn't understand if they were long done with us. Um, and we just watched. And after a while, both of our, by the way, we had wind up watches. We had good wind up watches, which were state of the art for the day. Uh, both of those watches stopped at 240, uh, 241 or something for Toby's. Mine was 240 on the nose. Um, my watch, which was an Elgin, never worked again. I wish I'd saved it. No. Um, but that watch never worked again. So, again, some passage of time, minutes, not hours. And um, there was a change. There was a bright um, light that came on right from the center of the triangle and underneath. And it was about 30 feet in diameter. Uh, I'm guessing that because it was about as broad as the thing was high off the floor of the, of the meadow. And this was that, uh, it had the same white quality as that uh, beam of light that landed in our campfire. It was a milky like white. It was um, like if you had a high power searchlight in, fo in fog, you would see a white column of light. That was the quality this had to it. And uh, as soon as this light came on, uh, all the little gray guys walking around the meadow turned their attention toward it and started making their way towards it. And they weren't, they weren't rushed, they weren't running, didn't seem to be in a hurry, but they just meandered their way toward this light. Um, and they would step into the light. They were already paired up into pairs, grouped up into twos and threes. So they would, their little group of two or three would step into this light and then they would dissolve. And it looked very much like there was a, the old Star Trek, the original, I'm not a sci-fi fan, so, um, but in the old Star Trek, there was the transporter thing where they would stand on a small podium and then just dissolve, pixelate out. Um, that's what this was like. They would just pixelate out and they're gone. And we were, we're again, we're, we're terrified out of our wits. And we watched until the last couple of guys stepped into the light and dissolved. And as soon as they did, the light turned off. Um, and the lights on the, on the triangle at the points changed. And they were, while they were multicolored yellow, orange, uh, and flashing, they changed to a solid white. And we watched this thing take off. I mean, it, it, it didn't take off like a rocket ship. It just kind of lifted up like a hot air balloon and went up in the air. And we watched it until it was, you know, two lights and then one light and then gone. And my friend is hyperventilating. So I got him to get a hold of his breathing. And uh, I said, I'm not leaving this tent. I'm not leaving this tent until daylight. I mean, all I had over my head was a piece of canvas, but I felt like it gave me cover. I didn't feel vulnerable. And one of the after effects is to this day, I don't like being out in the open. I, I, I feel vulnerable. If I, if I had to walk across a, you know, a field that's a half a mile, I would walk a mile and a half to go around it rather than cut across it in the open. Um, that's just one. So. And was there, was there any noise associated with the craft? You know, when, when, the, um, when the lights from the cylinder of light where the little guy stepped in, when that turned off, we didn't realize it. But we had, there had been a low pitched humming noise. A, I call it a droning noise in the book. Um, but you know, if you hear a noise like that, 
long enough, you become accustomed to it. So it must have been because we woke up, neither one of us noticed that, but we noticed when it turned off. We, we could hear the absence of it, if that makes sense. Yeah. And uh, that was the only noise that, that we heard. Uh, but when it went up, it was dead silent. It rotated a little bit, but uh, it just went straight up. And the higher it got, the faster it went. So my, uh, my friend talked me out of waiting until daylight because we, we had no idea what time it was. We knew it was sometime after 2.40 is all we knew. And uh, we, he convinced me that we, we should go now. And we did. I grabbed my, uh, my wallet. He grabbed his. I grabbed my car keys. Um, he had his little flashlight with him. And, uh, and that's all we took. We left the tent. We left his nice Coleman cooler. We left his backpack with his camera in it. We left everything. Um, I mean, that speaks to how, how afraid we were. And we darted to the car, got in, slammed the door. And I remember saying, are we good? And he turned on his little flashlight and looked under the seats and in the back seat. Of course, we got the doors locked. Um, but yeah, he had to check the car to make sure there was no, nothing in there with us. We were that freaked out. And I'm like, you know, how, how am I going to find my way, you know, through this forest in the middle of the night and not get lost? And uh, my friend had taken a bank statement or a, or a deposit slip out of my glove box of my car along with like a golf, little golf pencil. And he made like a rudimentary map. Uh, he had the foresight to do that. Um, so I, he knew not where, I, he knew where not to make a turn. He knew how to get us back to the pavement. And, and we did, we got back to the paved road and headed, uh, headed back to Whiteman. And it was, um, it was strange because and you know, I this was new to me. I didn't understand it at the time. But you know, Ray Fowler's book about the Allagash uh, Four, um, they had the same experience where you know you had twins, the Weiner twins, and then their two friends, and they were real tight. You know, they did everything together. And after they had their experience, immediately after their experience, they kind of drifted apart, and they didn't talk about it. Uh, and they had, they had a pretty traumatic event. And uh, we didn't talk about it. Matter of fact, we didn't say it was really kind of a unpleasant six and a half hour drive. My, uh, we both suffered burns to the eyes. Uh, the emergency room doctor, of course, we knew everybody at the hospital, but the ER doc said that we had what he called flash burns. It's the same kind of burn that a a welder would get if they didn't use that mask to cover their face with a smoke glass. Uh, so my eyes were really sore and very photophobic. And, uh, you know, the morning sun was just killing me. Um, and my friend was the same way. As a matter of fact, my friend was a little worse off than I was. He, um, I had this 66 Impala and it had the big bench seats in the front. Uh, he's kind of curled up in a ball and um, he was miserable too. And we were both terribly dehydrated. I uh, just couldn't wait to find the first place, the first gas station we could find it was open. And so I could get something to drink. And we found one about an hour into our, our journey right across the line in Missouri and uh, went in and I got, I think I got, what did I drink? I got, uh, I don't think it matters. Um, it's like an orange soda or something. I was going to say, or I was going to say three cans of orange soda. Yeah. And uh, my friend Toby got like a gallon jug, jug of grape aid or yeah. something that was purple, if I recall. And he's chugging that. I'm chugging the, uh, I, I killed all three 12 ounce cans of, uh, orange soda in a heartbeat. And he drank about half of that gallon jug, put the lid on it and uh, set it down and then went back to sleep. 
And I, I'll tell you, I was so thirsty. I, I, I thought about actually swiping it. I thought about taking yeah. it and drinking it, but I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, at this point, do you guys, I mean, you pretty much figure this, this event is over with now. It's behind you. You're going to head back home. That's exactly right. Matter of fact, when, when the front tires of my car hit pavement, I felt like we were safer. You know, we were out of immediate, imminent danger. Yeah. And is, is, was there a point where you guys were like, okay, we, we have to go to the hospital because we're apparently we have these, uh, you know, the burns and the, the rash. There were, or... Yeah, we had, um, I had like, looked like insect bites all over my body too. Yeah. Um, and body aches. And um, so my friend and dehydration. Oh my God, I've never been so thirsty in my life. Um, and my friend said, you know, we get, you know, we got to go to the hospital. And that was kind of an issue because we worked at the hospital. Yeah. And all the people there were our friends and <laughs> it would be a little bit embarrassing. Yeah. And, you know, to make it worse, everybody in the squadron knew we were taking this camping trip, you know, because we were kind of, we were kind of the nerds of the squadron, you know, we're asking people, you know, we, you know, we'd never been camping. How do you do this? And they would look at us like, what are you stupid? You know, you take a cooler full of stuff and you take a tent and you go. Um, so everybody knew we were going on this trip. And uh, I got home, I dropped Toby off at his house. Both of, we lived in NCO housing on the base and Toby lived about two blocks from me. I dropped him off at his house. He got out of the car with his flashlight and uh, shut the door. Oh. And I, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I was going to say, in regard to going to the hospital, we made a promise. We made a, a, a covenant between the two of us that we would not tell a, a soul, not tell a doctor, a nurse, not another living soul about seeing a, you know, a UFO the size of Walmart uh, because we knew it would happen. And I, I know it would have happened. They would, they would have sent us out for a psychological evaluation. And had we been honest and candid with them, they would have labeled us with some kind of delusion or some type of mental defect. And we'd have both been kicked out of the air force. Yeah. And I, I didn't want that. I was in the air force for the GI bill because I wanted to go to school. And uh, I, I didn't, I didn't want to be kicked out on a medical discharge that, and neither did Toby. So we made that agreement that we would not tell them, you know, but you know, we both didn't feel good. We didn't want to lie. So we agreed that we tell them that, hey, you know, we went to bed feeling kind of funny. We woke up feeling strange and uh, felt bad enough that we just came home. So that leaves out a whole lot of stuff. Um, but at least it's, it's a truthful story. So that was our story. They, uh, I had probably one of the most thorough physical exams I ever had in my life. Uh, and they admitted me to the hospital. And it was odd because, um, well, number one, they gave me a private room, which as an enlisted guy, as a, as a non-com, I expected to be on an open ward. Um, private rooms were reserved for officers or people critically ill. Uh, so I thought that was odd. The other thing that was odd was as the doctor is finishing his um, examination, the hospital commander, who I knew well, and the base commander, and some guy in civilian clothes I didn't recognize, came into the exam room where we were, and the hospital commander did all the talking. And, you know, there was that officer versus enlisted man uh, barrier there where, you know, we weren't, we weren't equals. Uh, I, I don't know if that distinction is the same today as it was back then, but back then it was a, it was a pretty, uh, uh, it's a pretty big deal. And while I would, I could talk to the uh, hospital commander casually, you know, while on the job, if it wasn't crowded, there was no one else around. Uh, but otherwise it would be, you know, yes, sir, no, sir, with, you know, a bit more formal. Uh, and the hospital commander was very formal. And he addressed me as Sergeant Lovelace. 
And he said, uh, Sergeant Lovelace, you're to have no contact uh, with Senior Airman Tobias. Uh, you're not to have contact with him in person, uh, by telephone. Uh, you can't uh, send him anything. He can't send you anything. If you run into him while you're in the base exchange, you're to turn around and immediately leave. And you know, typical things you'd hear in a, in a personal protection order by a court. Uh, and it was a very solid no can contact order. And he said, do you understand? And I said, yes, sir, I do. I mean, I really didn't, but you know, there was something that changed. There was something different. This was the really the thing about Ray Fowler's book was, and I call the phenomenon, the band breaks up. And in my second book, uh, I had a bunch of people write to me. I published 25 of their stories in the book. And lots of people told me that they saw a UFO. Afterward, uh, nobody talked about it. You know, this, this one guy talks about how they were, uh, they were in a hotel parking lot, like on family vacation, and they saw this UFO. All, everybody did, a family group. Um, no one talked about it other than maybe two words. And 10 years later, you know, Uncle Joe, of course, always Uncle Joe. Everybody has an Uncle Joe. <laughs> Uncle Joe's at the Thanksgiving table. And he says out of the blue, hey, anybody remember that UFO we saw coming out of the uh, hotel or the motel back in uh, whatever year? And um, everyone went dead quiet. Uh, everyone was uncomfortable with it. And, you know, the question just got dismissed and everyone went on with their meal. But uh, it was it was a. Uh, yeah, no one wanted to talk about it. And that's real common. I didn't know that's common, but I had a change before before we had this experience. Toby was probably my best friend. You know, we uh, we worked together. His wife and my wife, we, we were both recently married. We're were friends. Um, and I suddenly wanted nothing to do with the guy. And it was a very strong, visceral gut feeling that I don't like this man. And um, I think that really speaks to the level of influence that these things can have over us. Because I'm sure that, that that thought, that idea did not come from me. Um, you know, I, I, I had this no contact order and I really wanted to tell the guy goodbye because he got, they cut him orders for Japan like at light speed. Yeah. So he was going to be gone in a few weeks. And uh, a couple of weeks after we'd been back, I uh, were coming home from the base grocery store, the exchange, and uh, we're in my wife's car. She's driving. And I said, swing by Toby's house. I want to tell him goodbye. And she's like, Terry, you know, don't, don't mess with these guys. You know, you've been warned not to have any contact with them. Don't, uh, don't poke the bear. You don't, don't, don't risk getting in trouble. You know, you... hospital commander said there will be consequences. We don't need consequences. And I like, look, I know I'm going to be three minutes, go in. I mean, I worked with the guy for a couple of years. I mean, he was my friend. I think I, even though I wanted nothing to do with him, I felt like I owed him a goodbye and a handshake, good luck. I kind of felt like that would give me some measure of peace um, because I certainly was not at peace after this. And she pulled up to the house. I hopped out, I ran up to the door, same door I'd walked through a hundred times before and did what I always did. I knocked three times and I just opened the door and said, hey guys, it's me. And um, Toby's wife was walking past and she had a box or a lamp or something in her hand. They were packing uh, for their relocation. And we were, we were friends, but she gave me a very hard look and uh, said, you're not supposed to be here. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I know that. I'm just here to say goodbye to you guys, wish you well, and I'll be on my way. And Toby had heard this exchange uh, we we're kind of in the vestibule of the house and he came around the corner and uh, I was shocked by his appearance because uh, while, while I'm kind of a slob, Toby was always 
meticulously dressed. I mean, he's the guy that always had, you know, the, the starched uniform. Uh, he always had a haircut within rags, um, always shined his shoes. Uh, and even when he was in civilian clothes, he always dressed well. And now, you know, I cut him some slack because he was moving and I know what, how much work that is and it's a dirty job. But he came around the corner and his hair was all wonky and uh, he had on a dirty t-shirt and blue jeans and was barefoot and I'd never seen him like that before. And uh, he, um, he walked up to me and I held my hand out and to shake his hand and we kind of missed, it was awkward. We did this thing until we finally uh, managed to handshake. And I said, I just, I know you guys are going to Japan. I just want to wish you well. And um, he looked up at me because he was shorter than I am. And I could smell vodka on his breath or liquor of some kind. I assume it, I assumed it was vodka. Uh, and that was unusual because he wasn't a drinker. I mean, you know, at, at a barbecue or something, he might have a half a can of beer, maybe a whole can of beer, but that was it. Uh, I certainly never saw the man drunk. Uh, his eyes were bloodshot. I mean, he looked like hell. I probably didn't look much better, but um, he looked up at me and he said, it happened, didn't it, Terry? And I said, yes, my brother, it happened. You're not losing your mind. And he said, but, but why us? And I said, man, I don't have an expletive clue. And um, I ran out of the door and ran back to the car. And it did that, that interaction did not bring me anything peaceful. It, it really didn't. I, I mean, I had my struggles after this event. Toby had struggles with alcohol that um, pretty much ruined his life. Uh, so his overall takeaway from this encounter wasn't positive, I'm sorry to say. Um, I had a lot of anger because I felt like I was violated and I was, you know, by, by yeah. our standards. I felt a lot of anger toward these things. But, you know, over the years, that's subsided and I'm, I'm kind of at peace with it, if that makes sense. And I really don't have a, a grudge against them or any hard feelings. Um, I still have some PTSD that I'm dealing with to this day. You know, I'm 67 yeah, years old. I sleep with a light on. I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, I was going to say, do you have any kind of thoughts on on maybe, you know, again, after all this time, maybe why it happened or the meaning or any any kind of thoughts in, in regard to that after, you know, reflecting on it after all this time? You know, when I look back, I had had experiences as a kid. Um, and then I had, you know, years hiatus until this happened in 1977. And then I had another 10 year hiatus and I had another event in 1987. And uh, intermittently throughout my life, um, you know, I think I was, I think I, Two things. I think, number one, I'm not sure if this wasn't Toby, maybe even subconsciously engineering this some kind of way, uh, because it's not the typical kind of thing the two of us would do. It was really kind of out of character for us to do this. And looking back on it, it felt like it had a, a vibe like we were keeping an appointment more than just going camping. Yeah. So I wonder about that. And uh, I, I think my assumption, I think like a lot of people, uh, especially people who get tagged as a young, as a young child uh, and can remember it at least, uh, once you're tagged, you're tagged for a lifetime. And I, you know, you're kind of in the club or whatever. But they're, they're, for me, they were never, never gone. No, it was, is, I mean, was your feeling then or, or 
again, you kind of explained a little bit, or is it now, um, did it feel malicious or indifferent? You know, I, I don't have any ill will for them. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty much at peace with it. I mean, I still have things that interfere with my life. For instance, if, um, well, like when there used to be malls, you know, no, no malls, shopping malls anymore. I, I would walk, I walked around the corner, my wife and I were Christmas shopping. This was in 1987. And we walked around and uh, there was a new store that had uh, naked mannequin, sorry, naked mannequins, uh, women's mannequins uh, from the waist up and they were set on a table. They were gonna dress them in blouses, I guess. And their arms were all kind of in weird poses. Um, they didn't have on wigs and it was just the, the uh, molded facial features of a mannequin. And I walked around the corner and I saw that and I freaked out. And I don't know why that struck a nerve, but it, but it did. Um, and I, I was, uh, I mean, my heart was racing. I guess it was a panic attack. Uh, one of the few that I had in my life, uh, but it was very unpleasant. So, so there is some residual. Yeah. Uh, but uh, going back to the hospital, you, you had a visit from some people in the air force. Do you want to explain that? I sure do. Cause that's a, that's a big part of the story. Uh, and I think that's still part of my life in right. ways. Um, and I, yeah, I want you to explain what you mean by that as well. Oh, I will. Yeah. 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 Um, it was my second night in the hospital and my, the night nurse who I knew well came in to give me an injection, which was for pain and for sleep. And they kept the lights turned off in my room because I was still photophobic from this eye injury. And these two guys came in and they were dressed in blue suits, uh, blue business suits. Um, sorry, I have a cat that's just like freaking out here. Two guys walked in in blue business suits. And I mean, you could tell, I could tell that they were policemen. They, they were, they were plainclothes detectives. Uh, they were OSI or the Office of Special Investigation. The OSI is the investigative branch of the Air Force's security police. Uh, OSI is to the Air Force what NCIS is to the Navy, if that makes sense. So yeah. these guys, they, they, they followed the nurse in and the one older guy, middle-aged and a younger guy, maybe 30, the older guy did all the talking and he said, if that's going to sedate Sergeant Lovelace, it's going to have to wait. We have some questions to ask him. And they flashed the badge and they were kind of, um, and I don't want to stereotype anybody. I mean, I got to have respect for law enforcement. I worked as a prosecutor for a while and worked closely with uh, police. But um, these guys were cops. I mean, you could, you could just tell they were, they were cops. And um, the nurse, they told the nurse whenever they told her not to give me the injection, uh, the older guy was rude to her and told her, uh, you know, and shut the door on your way out. He said something rude to her, and, which I didn't think was called for and, uh, and kind of, you know, didn't do anything to, you know, make me feel better or relaxed. So the nurse leaves, shuts the door behind her, and the older guy goes over and turns on the overhead lights. And I said, sir, could you turn those off, please? I, my eyes are, I, I had burns to my eyes. And he said, and he had this um, Southern accent. I don't know if you've ever spoken to Calvin Parker, um, but it was Mississippi, Alabama, maybe. Uh, and he said, you know, can't work in the dark, son. Got to see what we're doing. Uh, okay. So uh, they cranked up my head, the head of my bed. It wasn't an electric bed, it was hand crank. And they cranked it up so I'm sitting bolt upright. And they slid my tray table on in front of me. Um, 
and they um, they started this interrogation. They they started off by saying, uh, you know, Sergeant Lovelace, you they found a park rangers found your little campsite down there, and uh, all your stuffs there, and uh, I think that means you plan on going back. Uh, what do you got going on down there? You and your buddy growing some marijuana? Is that what this is all about? I mean, that's comical today. Uh, but back in the day in 1977, had I been growing a patch of marijuana on federal land, um, I mean, it would have been a dishonorable discharge and a trip to Leavenworth, seriously. So it was a big deal. It, it was a big deal. That, that intimidated me. Um, and the park ranger even said, you know, that's federal land. And I kind of scoffed at that. And I think I even said that in the book. I said, you know, no way this is federal land. It's part of, the, of a state park, not federal land. And uh, in 2016, you know, four years after I published this book, I found out that, or 2016, 20, pardon me, 2020, uh, I found out when the, I got the Google Earth pictures and the co map coordinates that this actually, that actually is federal land. So, uh, and he did, you know, typical police interrogation kind of things that uh, kind of tripped me up and said things that were intimidating. Uh, and I was thoroughly intimidated, I'll say that. He went in his briefcase and he pulled out uh, some forms and he placed some forms in front of me. And I could, I couldn't, my eyes were screwed up. I could, I couldn't read them. And I'm like, sir, what are these? And he said, well, son, these are consents and waivers. Uh, and it's a, it's your consent to let us take a look at your car and take a look in your house. Uh, you don't have anything in your house. You don't, you'd be afraid of us finding, do you? And I said, no, sir. And he says, well, you, you don't have a big bag of marijuana in the back of your car or in your, tr or in your trunk, do you? And I said, no, sir. And he said, well, then you wouldn't mind if we take a look. And, I, and you know, I was you know, 22 years old. I didn't have the benefit of life experience. I certainly didn't have the benefit of a law degree. And uh, I said, sure. Anyway, I, without being able to read what I was signing, I signed all six forms. And he scooped them up and, and was very satisfied with that. And uh, the, uh, the nurse came back in. Well, and, and I should say, uh, the reason that I felt intimidated and still feel intimidated by these guys, um, some things have passed that I, I are probably outside the scope of our interview here, but I, I, I believe that there's a file on me somewhere. Just like I believe that there was a file that kept Toby and I from ever connecting. Because I made some effort to find him and uh, wasn't able to, I wanted to speak to him in 1986. And um, I had a, a, an officer tell me that, um, that he was dead that he was killed in a crossover car accident on 94 headed toward Detroit. And I'm like, what do you mean he's dead? That's, you know, he's a young man. And I could have easily called the state of Michigan uh, Highway Patrol in East Lansing and found out the truth. Uh, or maybe they'd have lied to me too, I, I don't know. After I, after I finished this book in 2016, I was trying to find his uh, obituary. And he didn't die until 2007. So we lost all those years where we could have had contact. Um, but I don't think that they want us to put our heads together. You know, uh, Robert Hastings told me, you know, he was the author of UFOs and nukes. And he's yeah. talked to hundreds, if not thousands of, of uh, military veterans who've had experiences. And he said, you know, just like Toby getting transferred at light speed to Japan, they, they don't want you two guys to put your heads together because two guys with a, with a consistent 
uh, story is much more believable than one. So that was his rationale anyway. So I was, I was thoroughly intimidated by these guys and I didn't know it, but I would have another experience with them about six, seven weeks later. Um, they sent, uh, uh, I'm going to kind of cut through some stuff here to get to the, yeah. to the meat of things. They sent a car over to pick me up um, from work one day. Uh, first sergeant uh, told me to see the uh, the commander of the, the, of the place. And I went, I talked to him and they had me working in a supply, uh, in a supply uh, depot, uh, just because they wanted to separate Toby and I. Toby was still at the hospital. I was outside the hospital. And uh, he said, the, uh, the OSI would like to speak with you. They're sending a car for you. It should be here any minute. If I were you, I wouldn't keep them waiting. And I said, yes, sir. And I ducked into the bathroom, checked my appearance and went out the front of the place, front doors. And as I walk out the front door, here comes this uh, dark blue squad car, security police squad car pulls up and a guy gets out and says, uh, Sergeant Lovelace. And I'm like, are you stupid? It says Lovelace right across my chest, you know? And I said, yes. Uh, and he was an airman. He was a two-stripe guy. And he said, hop in. And he said, I, I'll take you to uh, security police. They'd like to talk to you. I'm like, okay. So uh, we got there. We went through like a double, double door thing where they buzz you to go into like a central area and then buzz you again to get into the main building. Um, and it's very common, I guess. And uh, took me down a hallway to, uh, there were exam rooms on either side, interrogation rooms, and it took me to this, uh, it was the last door on the right, and I think it was marked either D or E, I don't remember for sure, I think it was, I think it was E, and he opened the door for me with a key and said, have a seat, someone will be right with you, and the door shut behind him, and I knew it was locked, and it had a, you know, seven by five inch uh, glass pane in the door that had these cross hatch of wires in it, I guess, um, to make it unbreakable. I don't know. Uh, and it was, it was small about the size of, uh, the size of a bathroom, a good size bathroom, um, small bedroom. There was a desk. It was like an old 1950s vintage iron steel desk. Uh, with uh, 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 an office chair on rollers. And there were uh, four of those, uh, they were scooped like uh, chairs that were real common in the 70s. You don't see them anymore, but you used to see them in waiting rooms and the like uh, out of molded fiberglass. And there was one of those in each corner. And I noticed there was a framed mirror on the wall which I thought, you know, number one, who would be grooming themselves while they're in a hospital or in a, or in a pardon me, security police interrogation room. And uh, two, who would install a mirror by framing it into the wall? So with that, I made the assumption that it was probably a two-way kind of affair. I really wanted to go up to it, like cup my hands and see yeah. if I could see into it, but I didn't, I didn't have, I didn't have the nerve or the stomach for that at the moment. Yeah. So. I sat and I waited and I waited and I waited and uh, I got there sometime after nine, I think it was, it was almost noon by the time these guys joined me. And it was, it was the same two um, OSI officers that visited me while I was in the hospital. And uh, they had, they had a key and they came in and they were having a conversation and they didn't reintroduce themselves. They just completely ignored me, except to kick me out of the more comfortable chair. Uh, the older, the older guy, the, the major took my, uh, took the uh, office chair and uh, I switched over to one of the uh, fiberglass ones. And uh, the first thing he said to me was, 
well, we just might close your file today. Would that make you happy, Sergeant Lovelace? And I said, yes, sir, it would. That would make me happy. And uh, he said, well, you know, you're going to be hypnotized today. And I said, no, sir, I did not know that. And he said, well, yeah, you're going to be hypnotized and they're going to give you a little medication that'll help you relax and it'll help you remember. And I said, yes, sir, but, but, but why? I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want this. And, you know, and in typical fashion, he said, oh, you, oh, you don't want to do this? Well, that's no problem, son. Uh, he said, I got, your, I got your signed consent right here. And he slams it on the desk in front of me and says, is that not your signature, son? And of course, it was my signature. I signed it in the hospital. And uh, he said, now, I can tear this up. We don't have to do this today. And he said, I'd be happy to tear it up for you. Um, and I said, I, I'd like that, sir. He said, sure, no problem. We'll just tear this up and I'll just see you at the court martial. How about that? <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, you know, they're talking. I mean, oh, that, now that scared me. I mean, I, and I'm like, what are you going to, what are you going to court martial me for? You know, I, I, haven't, I haven't been arrested. Um, so I, but I was thoroughly intimidated. I, I, I will say that. And I, I don't know what would have happened that day had I pushed him to tear it up. I don't know. I don't think anything good would have come of it. Just like I think if I would have challenged him and said, you know, I have Fourth Amendment rights here, and and yeah. you know, I, I don't think that would have played well either. Yeah. So, um, I said okay, and sometime later, a few minutes later, uh, there was a knock at the door, and the captain, the younger guy, got up and let him open the door, um, and it was this major. Big girl, chested guy, blonde hair. Um, he had, you know, typical Air Force, you know, uniform with the blue shirt, and he had oak leaves on his collar, so I knew he was a major. But he had no name tag, and that was very unusual. Um, in six years in the Air Force, I never saw an officer or an enlisted man in that kind of uniform without a name tag. So it was, it was unusual. And he introduced himself and, you know, glad handed me and was very, you know, personable. And uh, I assumed he was the hypnotist and I was right. And he had a little, uh, like a leather shaving kit. And he laid it out on the table and he took out uh, a syringe with some yellow fluid in it, a tourniquet, rubber tourniquet, uh, some ba a Band-Aid, some alcohol swabs, um, and a towel, I think a towel. I think that was it. Um, and he said, you know, I'm going to give you some medication and it'll help you relax and it'll help the hypnosis. It'll be easier. Now, it, at this point, I had been taking classes. My undergraduate degree is in psychology and I was taking classes in psychology at, at the university on the base. On the, on the base. Uh, Central Missouri State University had uh, held classes on the base that, that I could take using my GI Bill, and I wanted to get a jump on my uh, on my undergrad. So I'd taken some some psych courses. I didn't think they could hypnotize me against my will. I heard that felt pretty confident against the, about that. So I made the decision that I would resist the hypnosis and covertly, you know, not. Not obviously. Um, so I assumed this relaxed position and he did this. Um, I'm certified in hypnotherapy now, by the way. Uh, so I'm familiar with what he did now. Uh, I wasn't back then, of course, but he did this progressive relaxation thing where, you know, you're at the top of the stairs. We're going to go down in the basement and check on some things. I want you to take that first step feeling nice and the tone of this voice is typical uh hypnosis you know take that first step feeling calm and relaxed calm and relaxed take that first step down take the next step down feeling twice as relaxed now comfortable yeah. warm you know and uh with that tone of voice and walk me down this flight of stairs in my mind's eye i'm going up the stairs and i am in my mind's eye i'm 
I'm playing Beatle music, going through the lyrics, you know, Rolling Stones, doing multiplication tables, anything that I can think of to do to not surrender 100% of my mind to this guy. Um, did it work? I don't, I don't know. I think so. Um, but I have, uh, I have doubts. Uh, I don't know for sure. Uh, I know this, that I had absolutely no control over that drug, which by the way, I found out was sodium anatol. Uh, I had a nice talk with Richard Doty about, about this topic. Um, what did he say about it? Well, I, I, don't, I don't want to speak for Richard Doty. I'd rather him he do it for himself. But um, somebody made a comment on uh, my Facebook page about uh, something that I said, and I don't remember what it was, but they, they came back and said, oh, that doesn't sound right to me. And Richard Doty, who I didn't know, had never met, weren't friends with on Facebook, jumped in and said, well, I think you're mistaken. Mr. Lovelace is correct. That's the protocol or something to that effect. Yeah. And for people listening, they'll be familiar that Richard Doty used to be in the Air Force OSI. He did. He was a special agent in the OSI. So, uh, yeah, I thought that was very kind of him. And we, uh, I was in a, in a weird place. And again, I don't know how much of this is attributed to the uh, hypnosis and how much of it is attributed to the drug. I think it's probably 80, 20, um, but I did my best to resist the hypnosis. So he took me back and he said, uh, you know, we're gonna go back now to your camping trip. Do you remember your camping trip? Yes, yes. Um, he said, and you saw something funny there, didn't you? And I said, yes, I did. And uh, he said, um, uh, it wasn't an airplane, was it? And I said, no, sir, it was not. And he says, well, what did you see? Um, he didn't lead me. Uh, and I said, we saw a UFO. Um, you know, I was, a little, I was struggling with the vocabulary because UFO really wasn't in my vocabulary. Uh, I think I said flying triangle. I mean, to me, 1977, it was flying saucers, you know, and I saw a flying saucer when I was a kid. So um, that's why I was confused. This was a triangle, you know, flying saucers are, so are around. So this is a triangle, ergo, maybe it's not a flying saucer, you know. Um, and he said, uh, what happened next? And I said, well, we were in our tent and they took us. And he said, and he wanted me, he wanted to know what I remembered of being inside this thing. And unfortunately, I've never had a clear linear memory of everything that's happened, happened while we were there. But I do have memories of being inside this thing. Uh, I mean, glimpses, flashes of memory. And I'm happy to share those. Uh, the first memory that I have is Toby and I standing next to one another. And I'm aware, I'm awake now, conscious. I hope my eyes are open and I'm looking around and I can't move. I can move my eyes, I can rotate my eyes in any direction, but I can't move a muscle, I can't turn my head. Uh, I can't move, I'm, I'm paralyzed, um, much the way Calvin Parker and others have been. Um, so I had no idea what was in back of me, but I'm looking in front of me and I was struck by the fact that this place was enormous. You know, I mean, the thing that was hovering over our campsite was as big as a Walmart. So, I mean, it was big, but um, the thing that I was in was like, like an NFL stadium. It, it didn't make sense to me. Now, I don't know, maybe they took us someplace different. Uh, I'm thinking more likely the laws of physics are, are different for them, you know, and, and something that they have control over. Uh, that's, a, that's a real possibility. Uh, but I was in either a different place where they did something to 
expand it or give the illusion that it was, no, I think it, I think it was expanded. I think I was in some huge humongous place. And uh, there were these little gray guys who were running around all over the place. On the left, to my left, I saw what looked like big garage doors and I saw silver disc flying saucers in a row lined up. I mean, like, like planes under a carrier deck um, and a row of them. And I saw there was a lot of activity. I saw that there were like multiple levels uh, and walkways all around. Um, and a little gray guys were going all over the place. And I, you know, I have a, just to interject here, I, I have a theory about the little gray guys. And that is that I, I don't think that they're sentient like, like you and I are. I think, I think they're mass produced. I think they are, uh, you know, probably, I don't know, AI and nanotechnology and some biological material thrown in and quantum computing. And, you know, they, yeah, like a program make, life form. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that were, were there any other types of beings that you saw on there as well? There were. Uh, the first one I'll describe was the one that uh, walked past my line of sight. Um, this guy was about six foot tall. So it wasn't a little gray guy. His skin was not gray. Um, his skin was kind of a pinkish, pinkish flesh color. Um, which I'd never heard of. Uh, to this day, I've, I've not heard of a description like that, but that's, that's what he looked like. Uh, very sparse hair, uh, no discernible ears, just a, a ear canal, uh, you know, two holes for a nostril. He had the large eyes, but they weren't, they weren't incredibly large, like a motion picture characterization would be. These were more like a pair of, of wraparound Ray-Bans, kind of large, um, but they were jet black with no sclera, uh, pupil, no uh, cornea. It was just all black. Um, and he walked past and he was wearing a, um, what looked kind of like a knit garment. I couldn't get a great look at his shoes, but he was, it looked like his shoes were incorporated into his pant legs. Uh, into this gray uniform. And I recall that it had a V-neck. I saw that much. I didn't see any insignia of rank or any, any identifiers, uh, but he walked past me and he's doing something to a panel off to my left. And I have my eyes strained as far as I can to the left to look at him. And just by happenstance, he turns and we locked eyes. And we locked eyes for a millisecond. And this was the most frightening thing that happened to me throughout this entire abduction event. This was hands down the most frightening thing that happened to me. And that was that I felt like this guy was in my head. Um, and I don't know any other way to put it. Yeah, I felt like he knew me, he knew my wife, he knew my plans, uh, my my secrets, uh, you know, he knew everything about me. And uh, all I got back from him was just raw intellect in those eyes. Uh, when I'm describing this, sometimes I use the analogy of uh, my dog, you know, I got a, I got a dog who's an English setter, will come, put her head in my lap, you know, I'll pet her on top of the head and um, and she looks up at me with those big brown eyes, you know, and I look at her, but she knows that I'm the alpha, you know, and in this equation with this guy, I felt like the dog. I felt just incredibly inferior. Uh, and that was a frightening thing to realize that there are living entities out there that are that far above us. So uh, that was it for that encounter. Another encounter uh, I remember was while we were standing there and I had, 
they had they had taken our clothing off and I had all my clothes and my combat boots in my arms like this, um, which explains why my socks were on sideways and my shoes weren't laced up because they had redressed us, undressed us and redressed us. And while I'm standing there with my eyes, and of course I'm scared to death, I can't do anything about it, but I'm scared to death. Um, I saw a group, maybe six people, five men, one woman, and they were all young people like my age, you know, 19 to 22 maybe. Um, they wore tan colored flight suits and I didn't know anybody, any, nobody in the United States Air Force wore a tan flight suit. Um, they were all dark green. I, I don't know, they all had patches on their left shoulder because their, their left side was facing me because they were kind of in a line until they kind of grouped together. And there was an orange patch on their left arm. Um, and I could not read what was on it. Uh, either, even under hypnosis, I could tell that there was some white writing on it, but there was just too much distance for me to discern what was said uh, on that patch. I wish I could have. But these these were humans, like people. Well, I got to tell you, these guys. They had what looked like co issue combat boots. They wore the same combat boots I was wearing. So I think they were human. And I think they were issued those combat boots. Yeah. So who knows? Completely ignored us. Completely wouldn't look at us. Completely ignored us. They did something in a, on a panel and uh, turned around and walked away. Um, but I'd love to know who they were. Uh, they yeah, should have yeah. looked human in every regard. Yeah. And uh, yeah, at this time, you have no sense of kind of where you are whether you're in a ship or in a base or i mean you're just in a, yeah 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 i mean i i knew that the inside where i was at didn't match the outside yeah but that's and and i i knew that you know i, I pretty quick made the uh, connection between well this thing was flying when we went to bed it parked over the you know i i was pretty sure that we whatever had us was extraterrestrial in nature yeah and um i this is this is going to be a jump ahead um but you you later discovered that um you actually had an implant i did and you know what that was really the catalyst i had no intention of ever telling anyone about this um never because I didn't see any way that it would benefit me. Uh, I kind of, and, and I was at odds with that because I kind of felt that I had a duty, you know, a responsibility to tell this story and explain it um, because I think people have a right to know. And um, so I woke up, I, Finished my job, uh, retired from the law in 2012. I was working for the state of Vermont at the time as an assistant AG and moved. Uh, we moved to Dallas where my wife and I have adult children and grandkids. And uh, we were here about 10 months. And I woke up one morning and as soon as my feet hit the floor, I realized I couldn't bear weight on my right leg my knee would not support me. So I told my wife, I said, you know, I need to go. I told my wife, I need to go to uh, the hospital, I'm afraid, because I can't, I can't bear weight on my right leg. So she took me, I get all my medical care from the VA. So she took me to the VA hospital. And uh, I waited in, in line, I, you know, finally saw a PA. I didn't see a doctor, I saw a PA who said, yeah, let's get an X-ray of your leg. So I went into the, uh, into the X-ray room and there was a tech there and she X-rayed my leg and uh, came out and, and you know, had an X-ray of my, 
of my leg looking straight at, looking at it straight on, and then from a side angle looking kind of like in, with my knee bent. And she took two x-rays and wait, there was a few minutes of wait time because I guess it was all done chemically back then. It wasn't digital yet. Um, came back and uh, took two more and then two more uh, and then was frustrated and asked me, she said, Mr. Lovelace, have you had, uh, have you been in an accident? Have you had something that could account for a piece of metal being in your leg? And I said, no, I've never injured that leg other than, you know, maybe a scraped knee as a kid. Um, and she said, okay, well, you know, there's an anomaly on your film. I'm gonna see if I can get a radiologist to come down and take a look for us. I'm like, okay. Um, and I was gonna ask her if I could see it, but I thought I'll wait till the radiologist gets here and I'll ask him or her. And a radiologist came down with a cup of coffee in his hand, obviously not happy to have been called down there. Um, so he, uh, he throws my um, x-rays up on a, on a view box and asked me, he said, um, what kind of accident were you in? I said, I've never been in an accident. He said, well, you have the structure in your leg that looks like it's under your skin. He said, it got under there somehow. Um, and he said, uh, you know, he says, you probably have a, a heck of a scar there on your knee. And I said, no, I don't have a scar on my knee. And he rolls his eyes because he doesn't believe me. And, and I said, doc, you look at my knee. I don't have a scar. And he said, sure you do. It may have happened when you're young. You may not just remember it, but you have to have a scar because you can't violate the integrity of the skin and have it heal without there being a scar, not to get something this deep into your fascia and tissue. Um, so I said, could I see what you're looking at? And he popped up on the view box, the x-ray and showed me on the right, there was a, there's a square structure about the size of a fingernail and there are two wires that lead up my leg. I don't know how far they go up my leg, um, but they went up my leg. And he said, uh, yeah, this had, this had to get in your body by some means. So I took off my pants again and he looked at my knee and he looked at it. He turned the lights off in the x-ray room and looked at it with a handheld black light uh, at different angles, because I guess scar tissue will fluoresce under a black light. I didn't know that. So um, he finally turns the lights back on and, and sits down and looks perplexed. And I said, well, doctor, may I ask you how often is it that you see something like this in the human body and there not be a corresponding scar to explain how it got, in, got under the skin? And he said, never. He said, I've been a radiologist 23 years. I, I can't account for how this thing got underneath your, your skin. Yeah. And that was, that was a chilling moment because um, he showed me the second x-ray too, which had the collection of bones in my, in my calf muscle that are kind of in a florette pattern. Um, and he said, you know, it's not usual to have bones sprout in the middle of a muscle, much less have them arrange themselves in a um, symmetrical pattern. So he says, I, I don't know what this is. He says, I can tell you that from looking at the x-ray film, these are the density of bone tissue. But why you have them or how you got them, I, I, I don't know. So, um, I felt stunned. You know, I felt stunned because in that moment, it struck me that these things had actually put their hands on me. And uh, that was something I thought was behind me. But that kind of ripped off the Band-Aid. And it was, um, it was hard for me to process. And um, that was really the catalyst to write Incident at Devil's Den and tell the, tell the whole story. And I'll be honest with you, I thought, I thought that I'd maybe sell a hundred books and you know have a box of 50 in my garage and 
that'd be over and then I'd feel better because I went through this cathartic exercise. Um, but it wasn't that way. Some, something in the book resonates with people, a lot of people. Yeah, and actually, I believe it's after you, you published the book, you got called from uh, somebody interesting. You want I, to talk I about did. That? Yeah. I did. I got a call from Tom DeLong. And uh, I think I can say that without him being angry at me. Um, I got a couple of interesting calls, but I'll tell you about Tom DeLong's. Uh, um, Lou Elizondo was on the call, uh, yeah. and I'll leave, I'll leave it there. Uh, Lou Elizondo, who is um, um, the former, he ran the ATIP program um, before. Now it's morphed into something else, but he left federal service to, um, to work for Tom DeLong at the To The Stars Academy. And they were devoted to the pursuit of the truth about aliens and UFOs. And Tom DeLong wrote a book. I, I haven't read it, but um, he wrote a book about, about the phenomenon. Yeah, I, he's, he's co-authored uh, a number of books. He's, uh, he's got a few fiction and a few nonfiction ones. Okay, okay. Yeah, Secret the Secret Machine series. Oh, that's and, it. Yeah. Is, is, is that the nonfiction series or the fiction series? So yeah, this, the, the fictional series, they're both called Secret Machines, but one of them is like, a, I guess it's going to be a trilogy, I can assume. And the other one is Secret Machines, and those are co-authored with Peter Lavenda, and those are the nonfiction Okay. Ones. So Gods, Man, and War are the nonfiction ones. So far, Gods is out and Man is out. War is the next one. And uh, the the fictional ones are uh, Chasing Shadows, A Fire Within, and uh, we're not sure about, I guess, what the next one is going to be called. And um, so and and so when when Tom called, what did he say? You know, I'm embarrassed to say that, I mean, I'd heard of Tom DeLong. Uh, my daughter played a song at her wedding from Tom DeLong. So, but I didn't remember that at the moment. Uh, my phone rang. I picked up my phone. I saw it was an L.A. call. Uh, I know a lot of people in L.A. So I said, hi, this is Terry. And he's, he said, well, hi, Terry. This is Tom DeLong. And I thought, Tom DeLong, Tom DeLong, who, who, who is this? Um, but, you know, I, I just said, you know, well, hi, Tom, how are you? And he said, couldn't be better. He said, want to talk to you about the things in your leg. And I said, Sure. I published my book on Amazon. It went up March 18th of 2018. And uh, this was late March, early April. I mean, it was soon. Yeah. Um, and in 2019, I was, um, my wife and I had this experience that lasted about a year where we had uh, helicopters buzzing our house. And uh, I mean, at first it was a joke. Yeah, they rerouted the traffic copter. Um, but after a while, it, uh, it, it wasn't funny anymore. It was uh, annoying. Uh, they would come three times, four times a week. Uh, they co always come between 9 and 11 a.m. And they would come out of the sky. Uh, the front door of my old house, I had depending on the time of year, the morning sun to my right, this huge tree to my left. Um, so my line of sight was limited to about 180 degrees in back of me. So I could hear the helicopters and then I'd see them either come around the tree or, or out of the sun and they would circle around my house and go back around and do this several times. So I'm annoyed. I start taking photographs of them and I did photographs to... Uh, try to find an in number. Uh, federal regs require that a, that a helicopter or anything that flies planes have an in number. N is in Nancy, uh, not a number, uh, in designation, like N is in Nancy, followed by a numerical sequence that identifies that particular vehicle. And uh, I took a bunch of pictures of helicopters. I got 120 pictures of helicopters. And they were, they were, there were three different kinds. 
uh, I have a good friend, uh, Dr. Bruce Solheim, um, who was a uh, Army Air Force, or pardon me, an Army helicopter pilot. And I sent them to him and he identified there were uh, Robertson R-22s and R-44s, those are civilian. There were um, uh, Airbus 350s uh, that are a commercial brand, but used by law enforcement a lot. Uh, and then the rest were just a hodgepodge of different military helicopters. None of them had an N number, none of them had any designation uh, of any kind. And if you read the FAA regulation, it's under the CFRs. Uh, at the bottom of the law, it states exceptions. And, and it states um, United States government vehicles uh, and, and certain agencies or something to that effect, vague. Yeah. So whatever these helicopters were, they fell into that exception category. And when when did the, the helicopter incidents begin? June of 2018. And then they lasted on and off about a year. June of 2019, Lou came, we were gonna move. We, we bought a new house where we're at currently. Um, I didn't really want to do that, but my wife was really rattled by this to the point that she felt unsafe. Yeah. And um, I knew there was no guarantee they wouldn't just follow us. Luckily, they didn't. Um, so, so we moved. Um, so June of 2018 through June of 2019, um, Lou came and spent a couple days here hoping to see a helicopter. And he didn't see, we, the time he was at my house, we didn't, we didn't see a helicopter. Then we went to, um, uh, there's a nice Tex-Mex restaurant not far from my house. And we went there to have uh, lunch and uh, had a nice lunch. And uh, Lou was very candid with me and uh, just, a, just a gentleman. We will walk and his cameraman there, he's got his cameraman there, uh, Matthew. And of course the camera's in the van that they're driving. Um, we come out of the restaurant, I'm walking to my car, they're walking to their van and right up the street, I mean, right over the street comes a, a olive green military helicopter of some kind, you know, doing 120 and it goes, right over us, right up the main street. And Lou turns around and goes like that. And, uh, you know, two weeks later we moved and that was the end of the helicopters, thankfully. Uh, well, I think with one exception. And that was the first night we were in our new home. We woke up, we woke up the next morning uh, and we were exhausted from the move. Woke up the next morning and we heard that familiar thump, 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 thump. And I'm like, Oh my God, you know, they're, they're back. Yeah. And I grab my phone, I run outside, I get outside, I look up and here is this olive drab green helicopter 500 feet over my house. As soon as I walked out and looked up, it peels off and it's gone. And that was the very last time we had any interaction with, uh, with helicopters, thankfully. Yeah. And, um, you know, you can answer this however you want. It's uh, after, after you got in touch with Tom, were there any kind of, was there any talk about doing any kind of tests or examinations? There was, and I had an examination. I won't use the doctor's name, but I had a, a qualified medical doctor uh, come down and uh, wanted to see my knee and wanted to talk to me about my story. Uh, took a fresh set of x-rays and uh, he stayed at a residence inn and I went over and we had two solid days of discussion, which was mostly me going from my earliest memories at birth through that day. Yeah. And um, of course, with a big focus on what happened in 1977. And um, we, got, we got to the end. He did not, by the way, he didn't take a blood sample. So that wasn't done. Yeah, uh, he did ask me if I had any Native American blood, um, which I didn't at the moment. 
know how that could have been relevant in any way, but I found out that I guess it is relevant. Yeah. And um, he, uh, when we when we finished, um, he was very kind, and he uh, said, "You know, you you might be not might be you are." Uh, what's called by some people, a targeted individual. And I'd never heard the term before. And I said, targeted by who? By ET? By the government? Who, who has me targeted? And that wasn't a real comfortable question. And he said, I, you know, I got a book that I'd like you to read. And um, he bought it from Amazon and it was delivered to me. And the title of the book is The Girl with the Emerald Eyes or The Girl with Emerald Eyes. And uh, I read it and it was about a, um, a guy that has incidents and uh, encounters and he's suddenly seeing, and this sounds outrageous because it's meant to be sound outrageous. He sees invisible little dancing midgets that only he can see and has other kinds of uh, auditory and visual hallucinations. And these things that he saw, heard, were tied to uh, Naval intelligence. Naval intelligence. Naval intelligence in particular, yeah. So the name of the book is The Girl with Emerald Eyes. I lent it to someone and have yet to get it back, um, but it's a very interesting read, especially if you're interested in my labs and, and that kind of thing, because it kind of discusses that aspect. Right, and again, it's really interesting that you saw humans on board this craft or you know that's very curious but it's something that's uh, been repeatedly observed for whatever reason um was there talk of, of doing a possible mri at all there, there was i took a set of x-rays i had a um and i should qualify this since I can ever remember. I've had a problem with electrical stuff. Electrical stuff goes crazy around me. Uh, I have computers break, go do strange things. Um, you know, phones that die for no reason. Uh, I think I think I may. I, I know I, I told you about the issue I had with the camera. The camera on this laptop I'm with you with today, talking to you on uh, quit wouldn't work. And then all of a sudden it's back working again. Um, in uh, 19, pardon me, in 2004, I had a heart attack and uh, I had a pace, pardon me, I had a uh, triple bypass and I had a pacemaker installed. And uh, everything with the surgery went fine. The pacemaker was fine. And then I'm back, I'm, I'm on the island of American Samoa, where I'm working as an assistant attorney general for, for the United States territory down there. Uh, but it's a little hospital. They don't have a cardiologist uh, on staff at the hospital. I'm 2,500 miles south of Hawaii. Uh, and my defibrillator goes crazy, malfunctions. It was a Medtronics uh, and shocked me. Like 52 times Jesus. before they could get me to the Queens Hospital in Honolulu where they had it removed. Yeah. Um, but they had to leave the, the uh, electrical leads that they used to install this thing. Uh, they're in the artery walls and they grow into the artery walls. Yeah. So they, they, they never remove them. That's uh uh, the, the surgeon's words were, if we remove them, it's going to be a very bad outcome. So I said, you know, just, just leave them. So I had metal in my body. I couldn't get an MRI. Can't get an MRI. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. And uh, going going back to the talk with with Tom, and you can't say who else was on the call over there. I can tell you it was Lou Elizondo, and and that's as far as I should go, really. Okay, that's understood. And um, regarding you know, there's a lot. There's been a lot of recent developments, um, you know, with the NDAA and and Arrow, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office um whistleblower protection and you know there's word that people are going to be speaking with arrow the, you know arrow um do, is there a possibility that you might be in contact with with any of that effort that's a possibility that is a possibility um so i'm just waiting for an email uh to know if i will or won't yeah but uh and uh you know you know, considering your, your, all your experiences, you know, how do you feel about kind of everything that's going on in the public stage now, you know, with this subject being more open or attempting to be? Attempting, right. Attempting, yeah. But, you know, I'm disappointed that we're not further along with the disclosure issue. And, you know, and now we have the distraction of China Taiwan, we have the distraction of Russia and Ukraine, we have the distraction of COVID. So there are a lot of distractions. But in that regard, uh, maybe that is all a good thing because maybe if they're going to make disclosure, it'd be a good time to do it when people's right. attention is directed elsewhere. Um, I can't believe that my children and grandchildren aren't going to see full disclosure. I, I, I think that, I think it just has to happen. It has to happen. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there's probably, I think there's probably ET walking around right now. Um, there was a book, uh, I've not read it, but I have a friend who, who read the book. Uh, it's called They Walk Among Us. Walking Among Us by uh, David Jacobs, I believe. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, Jacobs, I remember. Uh, so, um, but yeah, I, I think we should, we could walk past them on the street and uh, and never know, and uh, and that's frightening. And you know, that's the 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 thing about that is is like is that part of the reason why it's been there's been a lid on it for so long because, you know, how, you know, you're going to tell the public those kind of things, what's their reaction going to be. But at the same time, how could you not? You know, I don't know what the public is going to be. You know, I, I really think that the public, um, unfortunately, we live in a divided society. Yeah. You know, and, um, People can judge you by what news program you watch. Yeah. Uh, I'm on the record with Reuters and Associated Press myself, maybe Al Jazeera and DW Deutsche Welle. Um, but I don't want to be, I don't want to be a party to that mess. Uh, but the point is we're a divided society, uh, about right, like right down the middle. And if, uh, if something controversial like this broke, I could see maybe 50% of our, of, of the United States population saying, never happened, not true, it's a diversion, it's fake news. Right. So I don't know the answer, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that it's gonna take something dramatic, like, you know, an introduction on TV with an ET, and then, you know, then everybody's gonna scream, oh, that's a makeup job, come on. That's yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I wish I knew a good answer. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's the kind of thing is that the phenomenon could, could disclose at any, any given time, it could make pretty clear um, its presence, right? Do like Phoenix lights times 10, including a telepathic message to everybody at the same, simultaneously, you know, just like it could happen. Um, well, and, and that's kind of the point is something like that, that could happen another another phoenix lights type event even though I, there probably would be argument of whether it's 
real or fake or what have you, I think a lot of people would really start paying attention more after an, another event like that. And, and, you know, now that everybody has a cell phone with the high def camera and so on. I, I do too. And, you know, I've used the words that speaks to the level of their influence over us. I've used that phrase twice in the past hour or two. And, um, you know, I think that um, ET has the ability to open our minds to that. Yeah. Or, or close them. Right. So, and that's actually been speculation is that has, has, has the secrecy in some part, the embargo been influenced by the phenomenon itself. Yes. You know, that's just like, you, you have to start thinking about these questions. And if you look at the a tip slide nine that they had, you know, it's the, the things that are listed on there, you know, the cognitive human interface is one, but it's talking about psychotronic like effects that could influence dis decision makers or, you know, people in powerful positions and, all kinds of things. And, you know, they mentioned the trans medium and stuff, but they're talking about all the different uh, technologies and possible technologies that are observed with UAP. And, yeah. you know, that kind of um, what you're referring to is the influence that they have over us uh, potentially, or they seem to exert at times uh, is, you know, right on the top of that list. Sure is top of mind. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I know I, you know, we're all kind of looking for answers in this, but what do you have a feeling of, you know, two, two things, uh, I guess I would ask is the intention or, you know, or the relationship we might have with these, the others, uh, and, or if it's a, a singular phenomena or multiple phenomena. Um, by multiple multiple phenomena, are you talking about, uh, you know, various types and species of visitors here? Yeah, are and or talking? yeah, and or or you know, some possibly extra extra terrestrial, some possibly crypto terrestrial or ultra terrestrial, some possibly interdimensional, as Jacques Vallée proposes. Yeah, yeah. If I understand your question properly, I, I would address it like this, and that I think that there are countless countless entities, other dimensional, extraterrestrial, supernatural, who knows, I don't know. Um, but I think that that's the, that's the explanation why, you know, smart, credible, truthful people talk about their experience and people scoff and say, well, I've never heard of that. I've heard that, you know, I, I can't tell you how many emails I got saying, well, you know, you, I don't like the way you describe ET or pardon me. I don't like the way you describe the grace. You're totally wrong about that. Um, you know, and, and, and other things, but everybody, um, few people have an identical experience. So it's like if I went outside, if, if I got an Uber to the airport, I'm going to get a different guy every time. And yeah. A different car and uh, right. it's going to be a different experience. That's a great way of putting it. I like how you, how you kind of frame that. I think it's apt. Um, so we're, we're just about out of time here, but I did want to ask you, do you have any future projects or, or anything you're working on or things people should look out for? I do, and I'm, and I'm glad you asked. Uh, I'm working on a book on, uh, actually I finished a book, it's just going through final edit. Um, the name of the book is uh, Free Fall, uh, An American Near-Death Experience. Uh, I wrote it because I had, I had exactly four people email me um, between two, 2018 and, and now, or 2018 and 2021, uh, who are members of the near-death experiencer community and wanted to share with me their experiences, number one, and then wanted to say that they talk about there are many parallels between the alien encounter phenomena and the near-death experience phenomenon. And they're all conscious related. So uh, in that regard, there is some ties. So uh, it should be out on Amazon March, March 1st, I'm hoping. Yeah. And uh, also for people watching and listening, uh, where's the best place to find your work? Uh, I would, I, I'm going to link it in the description, but for people listening too, so it's easy. Sure. 
my my um, uh, paperback Kindle and an audio book. I did an audio book in my own voice, for better or worse. No, I love that. I I forgot to mention at the beginning. I I appreciate more than anything when an author reads their book, more than you know, anything. Author should read his book or her work. I mean, yeah. it's it's their work product. Yeah, so. honestly, when when there's an audio book that's not in the author's voice, I don't I don't I don't get it to be honest, most like 90% of the time, unless it's something I know I have to get through and yeah. like, you know, but if, if I hear an author read the book, generally I'm like, okay, I'm going to get this. Yeah. No. Plus I'm cheap. I mean, who can afford to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you know, I, I really appreciate your time, Terry. And I appreciate you sharing your story and continuing to do what you do and, you know, your involvement in the community and, you know, for experiencers and people who've had experiences like this, I think now more than ever with what's going on, this aspect of the phenomenon is, is crucial and it should not be overlooked. Although the, you know, the national security aspect, or even if we want to say the technological aspect is important, it is valid. Um, it's it's going to be crucial in, in bringing on board the academic and scientific communities in some regard, but this this is kind of getting to the core of it. What's our relationship to this phenomenon? And the fact that these kind of encounters have been going on on a regular basis. I mean, you, what, no, no government can tell us that this doesn't exist when it's affecting us personally. You know, so we have a right to know because people like you and people like me and many people watching this, They've had the encounters, so you, you can't tell them otherwise, and it's not right to. It's not yeah. right that there's a cover up and, you know, whether it's whether they think it's and everybody's best interest or not. If, you know, people are having experiences and, and, and effects, physical, mental, spiritual, medical, uh, you know, you have to be transparent about that because it's not good overall. Um for the individual, it's not good for the collective. It's not good for the country. So, you know, again, it's, it's, yeah, I, I had a guy walk up to me when I was at UFO Congress in 2019 and he went over to my, I was sitting at my, uh, you know, counter selling books and talking to people. And he, he came up and he said, convince me. Like, well, I'm not going to convince you of anything, you know, make your yeah. own decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's a shame that, you know, people have to deal with that, you know, the, and, you know, we know that in place was the protocol of ridicule and deny it's in the documents it's documented. And, you know, we, you know, we can't stand for that any longer. It's not right. And I think in, in, in dealing with this issue on individual and collective levels, we're, we're only going to grow no matter what the situation is, we're only going to grow as a people by facing our challenges as a species absolutely yep. and i i think and you know the the language has been bipartisan and bipartisan supported so i think it does have a potential to really give us perspective and our place kind of in the universe but also as a people like you know we're more alike than different than ever before and i think this is it has a potential like anything else to be dividing and or you know uniting we have this i think there's a great potential for this subject to unite people and bring people together and i really hope that's the case i hope so too james yeah so i look forward to having you back on sometime terry especially when your new book comes out i look forward Thank to reading much. it yeah and having you come on and talk about it and 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 again your other uh incident at devil's den that's the second book as well yeah incident at devil's den and the second book is called devil's den the reckoning right yes yeah and uh, yeah, they're both on Amazon. Uh, so, yeah, so we'll definitely have you back on to talk about that sometime soon. So, thank you so much, Terry. I appreciate your 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 hospitality. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, okay. take care. Take care.